Happy Sabbath again. That was a little weak. Or maybe you all were distracted with all the moving around going on. Happy Sabbath. That's much, much better. Um, You can see in your bulletin that today we're talking again about reigniting the Advent movement. The last time I was here a couple weeks ago, that's what we talked about. And just by way of a recap, as we get ready to move into what we're going to focus on for today, last time we asked the questions, why are you a Seventh-day Adventist? We recognize that there are hundreds of denominations, it feels like, out there, and you could be a part of any denomination. So we asked the question, what caused you to be a part of this denomination? We also took a look at identity and how it helps to inform our mission. I suggested that uh, to a large extent, one of the reasons why it feels like Adventism is having a little bit of identity crisis is because we've lost sight of our mission. And if we don't have a clear mission, we can lose the sense of why we're here. And the reason why we've lost both mission and identity in some parts is because we've lost sight of our history. And so we started to look in the Bible about the importance of knowing our history. We saw that it was something that God commanded the Israelites to do over and over to recount their history to their children. And today what we're going to do is we're going to continue that train of of discussion about our history but we're looking at how did we come into existence as a movement. Specifically, we're going to trace, if you will, through the Bible, the history of God's people to where we we are presently. Does that make sense? Before we go any deeper, I want to say a word of prayer, and then there's a handout that Uche is going to help me to pass out after we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you again for bringing us into your courts this morning. It is a privilege, Lord, to be able to open up your word and to to discuss and learn more about why we are even here. Why are we having this conversation? We ask you for the presence of your Holy Spirit that he may teach and instruct our hearts and our minds. For we ask this in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Does anyone know what a genealogy is? Genealogy. What is that? I see some. Go ahead. Someone tell me. David or Sister Sister Donna, anyone, what's, a, what's, ge- what's genealogy? What's that all about? Yeah. So it's tracing your, your heritage or your lineage back to the earliest ancestor you can find, right? Now, why do people even do that? It feels like it's a lot of work and maybe a lot of time. Why do people do that? Why do people trace their genealogy? Some thoughts. What did you say, Sister Lynn? Curiosity. 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 Anyone else? Why do people do that? Yes. I love that. It helps you understand why you are the way you are. Now, you know, tracing your genealogy is all the rage in today's society, right? You have Ancestors.com. You have all of these platforms. People send off their DNA, and they get some uh, reports back that say you're 5% Native American, you're 15% Italian, and they're, they're interested in knowing what makes me who I am. They believe that if I can have an understanding of my origins, then it might help to explain where I am today. Does that make sense? Are we tracking? So today we're going to do an activity where, where we're going to seek to understand the history of God's people, tracing it back to our earliest ancestors, if perhaps after that tracing of that, we might have a clearer understanding of who we are and why we're here. At the basis of that, I want to suggest to you something up front. I'm suggesting to you that from the entrance of sin, when the character and the truth of who God was began to be lost sight of as a result of sin, right? The reality of who God is began to be darkened in people's mind. You remember that the way that Satan got Adam and Eve to sin was because he distorted who God was, right? 
So people weren't really clear who God was. After sin, it's like the picture of God became a little fuzzy, whereas before it was clear. Don't get distracted by the paper. We're going to get there. <laughs> so God always calls these group of people that he seeks to use to accomplish and to keep a sense of who he is, to preserve um, his character, to preserve his truth. I want to suggest to you that that group of people he calls the church. Now, the concept of the church, is that just a New Testament thing? Let's turn to Acts 7.38 as I listen to all of your yeses, and I agree with you. Let's go to Acts 7.38. As you get there in Acts 7, you know that some of you may know that D, uh, Stephen, who was a deacon, was going to be stoned. And before they stoned him, he was given a defense or an answer to the charges against him. And as he gave his answer, he began to trace the history of the children of Israel. And we're going to pick up in verse, actually start at verse 37 and verse 38 with what he says. It reads as follows. This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall you hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. So what did Stephen call the gathering of the Israelites as they were going through the wilderness? What did he call them? A church. What does a church mean? Anyone knows what, 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 is a, what does a church mean? Is it a building we're in? We came to church, right? We, we came to the building? No, but what does the word church mean? Does anyone know the, the, the etymology or the roots of what church means? I heard someone said people. What are you saying? The called out one. So when you go and you look at it in the, in the Greek, for those who are into those things, it's called ekklesia, ekklesia, I should say, and it means a called out one, more specifically, a called out assembly. So God called out the children of Israel. He called them out of Egypt, and he set them up as his church, as called out ones. Now let's go to Deuteronomy 7. We're going to be building a little bit of a case here before we hit the, the tracing Deuteronomy 7, we are looking at verses 6 and 8. 6 and 8, as we build this case about for, the, for, for the God's purpose in the church. Everyone has it, amen? Yes. It reads as follows. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all the people that are up on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you nor choose you because you were more in number than any people, for you were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn, sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondage from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt." So here's what I want you to notice about what these verses are saying, right? God calls out Israel. They're going to be a special people unto himself. Do you see that there? He said, you're going to be a special people unto myself above all the people that are in the world. Now, did God choose Israel because there was something in their makeup that made them better than everyone else? Was it the way that they looked? Why did he say that he chose them? It's in the verses. Because what? Because he loved them. And because he had made a promise to Abraham, right? And God is keeping that covenant and he calls the children of Israel. I'm saying this because as we talk about tracing God's people, there'll be a temptation in the mind to, for, for the mind to say, so what are you saying? If God calls these special people, what about everyone else? Aren't they special? Aren't they important? Aren't they loved? And we're going to see that that's not the case. <laughs> that is definitely not the case. So let's continue to build this case. So God calls them out. Why does he call them out? Go to Deuteronomy 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4. And we're looking at verses 6 through 8. 
God selects a people, and we're going to look at verses 6 through 8 to see his purpose in it. You have it, amen? amen? It says, keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them as the Lord your God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? So what we see in these verses, what I want you to take away is that God calls out this special assembly of people, the Israelites, and he gives them special statutes and judgments, or he gives them a system of truth, a complete system of truth he gives to them. And why did he give them this, this system of truth? Well, when man sinned in the garden, man lost his righteousness, the righteousness that God had given him. He lost, in a sense, salvation. <laughs> and God was seeking always throughout history to restore man to a place where he would once again inhabit the garden because man got kicked out, right? So this complete system of truth that he gives the children of Israel contained everything that they needed to know so that they might be restored to a state whereby they would be safe to return to paradise that was lost. Are you tracking with me? And this system of truth was to make them spectacles in the eyes of the other nations. They were to look at them and say, wow, you guys are a marvel. You're so prosperous with your families, with your finances. Your children are so intelligent and well-behaved, this, that. They were supposed to be a marvel in the other nations. Why was that? Why was it important to God that it go down that way? Isaiah 49. Let's go to Isaiah 49, and we are looking at verse 6. Isaiah 49, and, and we are looking at verse 6. When you have it, amen? amen? All right, so verse 6 says, And he said, let me start from verse 5. And now saith the Lord that formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob again to him, though Israel be not gathered yet, Though Israel be not gathered, yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. Listen to verse 6. And he said, it is, a light, it is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. So what was God's purpose in calling out Israel and giving them a complete system of truth? What was his purpose according to this verse? I hear some rumblings, but I don't hear anything distinctly. What was his purpose in doing that? Yes, Karen. To be a light. To be a light, to be a light to the Gentiles. She's a fabulous, not only a fabulous professor, but a fabulous student as well, right? So he called them to be a light to the Gentiles. It wasn't his purpose that the Israelites were going to hoard this truth and say we're better than everyone else, right? It was, I'm giving you this light. I want you to help to demonstrate it to attract other people. I want you to be a light so that I can win others. This is a purpose of the church. So I want you to keep that in mind as we go. We're not saying when we talk about God choosing a special group that no one else is saved. We're not saying that no one else is loved or no one else is special or that God doesn't have people outside of that group. Because even though God called the children of Israel, Moses' father-in-law was not part of the Israelites, but he knew the Lord, right? So that's not what we're saying. I want you to be clear on what I am saying and what I'm not. Are you clear on what I'm saying? Amen. All right, awesome. Let us go to our paper now. We're, before we go, go there, actually, I want to read a quote. It's from Acts of the Apostles, a wonderful book that details the early apostolic church. For those who haven't read it, it's a great commentary in the book of Acts. It says this, The church is God's fortress, his city of refuge, which he holds in a revolted world. From the beginning, faithful souls have constituted the church on earth. In every age, the Lord has had his watchmen who have borne a faithful testimony to the generation in which they live. They live sorry. 
These sentiments, sentinels gave the message of warning, and when they were called to lay off their armor, others took up the work. So what I want you to pay attention to is that in every generation, God has had a group of people that have preserved the knowledge of who he is. Does that make sense? So let's go back to the beginning. You have your sheet. We're not going to hit all of this. I put some scriptures there so you can go back and take a look at things yourself. But I want us to do a quick survey to, through it because I want to get to the end so that we can begin to talk about where we are today. So you'll see that I started off the genealogy with Adam, right? Because Adam was the first man. <laughs> and Adam and Eve constituted the first church in the Garden of Eden where two or three are gathered in my name, right? I am there in the midst of them. So Adam and Eve constituted the, the first church, if you will, in, in the Garden of Eden. And as you're picturing this in your mind, I want to draw an illustration of a relay race. Has anyone ever seen like a four-man relay race? You have different people that run a race. They run a lap, and when they come to the end, they hand off the baton to the next person, and that person begins to run. So Adam then would be the one that started the relay race, right? He started the relay race. And when Adam had finished running that race, he handed off the baton to Seth. He would have handed it off to Abel, but we know that Cain killed Abel, right? So he handed off to Seth. And the Bible said that when Seth was born, it said, after this, men began to call upon the name of the Lord. We know that between Seth ran, and I'm suggesting to you that Seth hands it off to, to Noah. Now, we know there were other faithful people in between Seth and Noah. There was Enoch. There was Methuselah. I'm just picking primary ones as we are tracing the heritage. You with me? So he hands it off to Noah. We know that right before Noah kind of comes on the scene, the Bible describes how the wickedness of the earth was really great and that the thoughts of the imaginations of men's hearts were only evil continually. But Noah found what in the eyes of the Lord? Grace. grace. And because of that grace, God told him to build an ark for the saving of his household, right? And really for the saving of anyone else in the world who wanted to get on that ark. So Noah begins to run that race. Noah runs, Noah runs. And then the next major patriarch that you read after Noah is Abraham. And what did God tell Abraham? Say that louder, Karen. Nations, as you said. Amen. God made a covenant with Abraham. You read about it in Genesis 12, Genesis 17, where he said he's going to be the father of the faithful, and he's going to make him, um, he's going to make him the head of many nations. And so Abraham begins to run the race. God's promised that something's going to come through Abraham's lineage. Abraham has two sons. Well, he has more than he has, he has a lot more children, but we're only told two of their names. He has two sons. Who were his two sons? Isaac and who? Ishmael, okay. So he has two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. Who was the one that takes the baton next? Why was Isaac the one to take the baton? He was, a, he was what? Y'all are saying it very like, I'm not sure. I don't want to say it loud. And he was the what? He was a promised one, right? He was the promised one. And so Isaac takes the baton and he begins to run. When he's coming to the end of his life, he wants to give the baton to Esau, right? <laughs> but God had already said that Esau wasn't the one to take the baton. It was going to be who? Jacob. Jacob runs, and Jacob has 12 sons that issue from him. And these 12 sons become the foundation of what would be the children of Israel, the 12 tribes. And in a real way, we just read it in Deuteronomy. You can look at the scriptures that I have outlined here. But God chooses these 12 tribes to be his special people above all the other people on the earth. And he gives them some wisdom and insight. I want you to know that when God gave Israel the complete system of truth, there was nothing missing. Nothing was missing in what they needed to do to be successful in this life. But Israel always had a problem. And that was, even though they heard what God said, this is going to make you really special, they were like, mm-mm, I see what everyone else is doing, and they look to be more happier, right? 
they looked to be more prosperous, and Israel always wanted what others, what the other nations had. So it was always hard for them to fully step into what God's intent and purpose was for them. I wonder if modern Israel has any of that, any of that going on, but that's just something to think about. So the nation of Israel continues. They continue from that time. We, we come down to the, they have judges. You read about this in a book of judges. We come all the way down to the book of Samuel, where they begin to ask for a king, right? And that was in God's will, but God allows them to have a king. They have Saul, then they have David, then they have Solomon. Solomon, we know, was a wise man, but he wasn't wise all the days of his life, right? He was wise in the beginning, and he got wise again at the latter part of his life. But in between, Solomon made some choices that he shouldn't have. And one of the things that Solomon did as he was, as he was building up Israel, he began to tax the people very heavily. He, will, he was calling, and God told him this would happen if they had a king, right? He began to, you know how you have the draft and people have to do military service? So he began to draft people so that they could have their standing armies, if you will. When Solomon dies, the people go to his son, Rehoboam, and they say, listen, Rehoboam, your father was very hard on us. If you would loosen up just a little bit, we are going to serve you for the rest of our lives. We'll serve the house of David. Rehoboam said, let me think about what you've just said. So he goes to the older men, and he tells them what happened. And the older men say, you know what, Rehoboam? You should listen to the people. If you loosen up a little bit, then you can keep them. Rehoboam hears them, but then he goes and gets counsel from who? Younger. Some younger men, right? His boys, right? He goes and he says, listen, this is what's happening. This is what the older folks told me. What do you guys say? And they said, listen, Rehoboam, you need to tell those people, if you thought my father was bad, you haven't seen anything yet. And they give him all this thing to say, and Rehoboam unfortunately takes the advice of the younger men rather than the aged men, which had some wisdom. There might be some lesson there for us. <laughs> I'll let you decide that. So anyway, he tells the people, I'm not going to be loose on you. I'm going to be harder on you. They say, all right, cool, Rehoboam. We don't want anything to do with the house of David anymore. So you have a departure now, a split in the children of Israel. You have 10 tribes that becomes the northern kingdom. And then you have two tribes that are the southern kingdom. Those two tribes are Judah and Benjamin. Everyone else is like, house of David, you're over here. We're not following you anymore. It continues like that. You read about it in Kings and Chronicles. But then the northern tribe, the 10 tribes, become enslaved to Assyria. The southern tribes continue, those two tribes, until they go into Babylon, right? We're tracing God's people. But all along, even though Israel is in such deep craziness, and when you read the Bible, you're like, wow, is this God's people? They were still his special people, warts and all. They were still his special people. You read about the, the individuals there. You read about the, the Hezekiahs and the Josiahs, and you read about the prophets and those that still retained their allegiance to what was true about God in spite of the craziness that was going on. The children of Israel come out, or the two tribes now, because some of the other tribes got, gets kind of lost in the sauce because they've, they've been dispersed. But they come out of Babylonian captivity, and things begin to be restored. The temple is restored. They continue on until the time of Christ, right? And Christ is born into into the nation of Israel, still God's special people. Here is a pop quiz for our Bible students here. What prophecy tells us when the children of Israel, as a nation, would no longer have that distinction of God's special people in that way? It actually was in our, Sabbath, our quarterly this, this, um, this quarter. Anyone? What prophecy tells us when the nation of Israel, as a group, would no longer hold that distinction? Go ahead, Ushay. You look like you're like, should I? Go ahead. <laughs> Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9 in the 2300-day prophecy, which will 
go over in depth when we go through the Advent history for those who are interested in a Bible study, so you can understand it. But there's actually prophetic, a prophecy that tells you when that would cease to be. So the nation of Israel continues with that, continues on as God's people until AD 34 with the stoning of Stephen. And when you read the book of Acts, you see that shortly after that, the, the apostles right after Jesus left were heavily ministering to the, Jew, the Jews, right, from all over. There comes a time when they say, you know, when you read what Paul says, he said, listen, it was needs be that the gospel go to you first, but, but since you've rejected, we're going to the Gentiles. And from those 12 disciples, those 12 apostles, becomes a formation of the apostolic church, the Christian church. Are you tracking with me so far? The apostolic church, you know how things are when it first gets started? It's very pure. Everyone just love each other. It's like the garments are white. But oftentimes, as a movement continues to go on, it loses some of that purity, some of that intensity. It doesn't have to be so, but that's the reality of it. So the apostolic church, when you first begin to read about it, and I would, I would encourage you all to read Revelations 2 and 3 that goes through the seven churches, and then Revelations 4 and 5 that go, and 6 that goes through the seven seals, so that you're able to really trace the history of the Christian church from the apostles onward. It really gives you a detailed play-by-play -play of how things happen. And if you say, I would like to do that, but I don't know really maybe how to understand those things, feel free to reach out, and we can talk about how we can make sure that we're all in understanding of this. Amen? Amen. So the apostolic church continues. They're doing well. Shortly before Paul dies in Acts 20, he warns them that he knows that after his departure that grievous wolves are going to come into the church. He talks about how there's going to be some changes in the church. You also read this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It talks about this formation of this man of sin, the son of perdition, the antichrist that John said was his, the spirit was even at work, right? And what we see is that as the church started to, to, to grow, it initially was persecuted severely, the Christian church. It was called a cult. Sometimes we're afraid of being called a cult. But no real, when you look at most movements in their inception, they're always labeled with those terminologies. So we shouldn't be afraid to be called a cult. What we need to examine is whether we're a cult or not. But we shouldn't just be so afraid of the, the term that we're, we're willing to cast off everything. Because the disciples were called a cult, that early Christian church. Satan is very ingenious, right? So he starts to try to kill off the Christians. You know, you have the persecution on the Nero, Diocletian. Things are real difficult. And you know that when, when things are really difficult, you really only attract those who are serious. Because if you don't want to be a real Christian, you're not going to join a movement where you know your head is going to be on the line. So that's one of the things that kept the church so pure was the persecution they endured in the beginning. But Satan is smart. He says, all right, if I cannot beat them, because in the, in the beginning, as the Christians were being killed, if you killed one Christian, it's like 10 would spring up. Tertullian, who was an early church father, if you will, he said that the blood of the Christians are like seed. It's like it's watering the ground as fertilizer, and where one drops, 10 more springs up in its place. And Satan is, he's very upset with this. So he says to himself, if I cannot beat them, then I'm going to join them, right? And you begin to see, especially as we get closer to the 325s when Constantine is converted, the development of what would be the system of the Catholicism, right? The system of this man of sin, the son of perdition that Paul had talked about way back when, that John had talked about. And what you saw under the conversion of Constantine, in the beginning there was a clear distinction between what was God's and what wasn't, right? What was Christian and what was pagan. After that conversion, there began to be an influx, Revelation 12 talks about this, and an influx of ungodly men and principles and theories that came into the church, right? 
There were statues that were formerly devoted to pagans that now came to represent Paul and Peter and the apostles, right? There were all of these um, compromises that began to be made and the church began to lose its distinctive quality. Yet God still had faithful people in it. And those faithful people still continue to stand. But now instead of being persecuted by the world, they were being persecuted by other Christians. And Revelation 12, 6 and 14 talks about how there was this church that would be in the wilderness, that would be sheltered in the wilderness, preserved by God. And when you read through history, you read about, um, you read about movements like the Walden Seas, the Albigenses. You read about John Wycliffe, who was called the morning star of the, of the Reformation way before Martin Luther. There were people that were still holding fast to the truth of God. And they, weren't, they didn't have it in all parts. You remember we said that God had given Israel a complete system of truth? Through this downward spiral of the church, that system of truth had been lost. And one by one, God was seeking to reestablish that system of truth. I'm saying that to say even some of these very people that I'm naming were not perfect in all ways. They didn't have complete understanding, but they began to put some of the pieces together. Wycliffe, for example, way before Martin Luther and the, the, the um, Bible that they put on the Gutenberg press, John Wycliffe had translated the Bible into the English language because he felt like the people should be able to read the word of God. When you had this man of sin come up, this, this, church of, this church in the wilderness that developed in response to that, it happened during what time frame? Let me see if we're, we're tracking. Do you know how, what time frame does that happen? The Bible speaks about in Daniel 7 and Daniel 8 and Revelation 12. Uh, say it Cindy. Is it the point at the end of the day? So it'll be 457. And not, so no, no, I'm going to make okay. it plain. But I, I thank you for that. That was the beginning point of the 2300 days. But the Bible talked about in Daniel 7 that there was a little horn that was going to arise, right? And he was going to do all these things, wear out the saints of the Most High, think to change times and laws and all of these things. What time frame was that? 538 to when? 538 to? 1798. And it was called in history the Dark Ages. So it was during these dark ages that people were not allowed to freely have the Bible. A lot of the truths of God was cast to the ground. When you read Daniel chapter 8, around 12, 13, and before you get to 14, that text that a lot of Adventists know, right? The Bible says that this little horn was going to take the truth of God and he was going to cast it to the ground and trample upon it. And that's literally what happened. The truth of God was trampled upon. And those distinctive parts of the system of truth was no longer available for people in a real way. So God, in giving the Bible back when Wycliffe first translated and, and subsequently as the movement began, was seeking to establish the truth. It's interesting because there was a lot of, there was a lot of, Wycliffe had a group that followed him called the Lollards. They were in what became England, and they were against, they were against church and state being met. There was, a lot of, there was a lot of kernels of truth that was coming to light, but it was heavily repressed. And so after you had these, this church in the wilderness, in 1517, the protest got a strong impetus and became louder. The protest against what the Catholic church was doing because for many people in those days, Catholic Church was Christianity, right? It was what Christian meant. But they weren't following the complete system of truth that God had set up. And that's what you're looking for when you're tracing the roots of God's people. We're not looking just for a denomination. We're looking for where does truth reside? Where does truth reside? Wherever the complete system of truth is residing, that's where you need to be wherever it's found, right? So in 1517, what happens? Say it loud. You, the, Protestant the Protestant Reformation, which kicks off with what? I hear some rum. 
uh, Karen is doing it, and Uche's doing it. Martin Luther <laughs> writes the 95 Thesis and affixes it to the door in Wittenberg, and it kicks off the Protestant Reformation in a bigger way, but we know that there were precursors to this. It didn't start with him, but it had a greater impetus because of what he did. Now, I want to talk about a few things with Martin Luther and some of the other guys I'm going to mention. God begins in a real way, as I said, to restore some of the truth. What is Martin Luther very well known for? What, what did he add to the restoration of the truth that was lost sight of? Salvation by faith, right? Sola scriptura, so grace alone, scripture alone, faith alone, right? This is what he really adds to it. And out of Martin Luther comes what group of people? The Lutherans, right? You had Martin Luther. You had men like John Calvin that came up. He was part of, he was in France. And then, was he in Switzerland? He had went to, he was in Switzerland as well. And out of, out of John Calvin, you have what now is the Reformed theology, right? And as I said, everyone's, everyone didn't have the whole truth because there's a lot of Calvinism that we don't agree with, right? But God used them for where they were. John Calvin heavily influenced a man by the name of John Knox of Scotland who went on and out of those two, really you have what flows the Presbyterian church that was known for how, what they believed about church government. And that rather than in Catholicism where you had the priest up here and the people were down here, there was a sense that no, there was no distinction between the, the laity and the clergy except in function, but we're all equal before God, right? And we can all know the same things. You had John Smith and you had Roger Williams, who largely Roger Williams, who we have a lot of Baptists down south, right? Roger Williams is, is responsible for Baptists in America. And what did the Baptists, which came from the Anabaptists, but what did the Baptists add to the conversation? What, what points of truth, what point of truth did they hold to? Baptism by immersion, right? That people should be at a particular age and have understanding and that there shouldn't be infant baptism. So they added to these bits of truth. And then you had the Methodists, who started... From where did the Methodists flow? Does anyone know? John Wesley, John and Charles Wesley, which we have a lot of their hymns in our hymnal. And the Methodists, you know that name Methodist, the two brothers, when they were going to Oxford, they had started a club, and they were very, very disciplined in their devotional life and in their Bible studies, and they had a, method, a, a real method as to how they went about doing things. That's, that's where Methodist came from because of their method, methodology of how they approach the Christian disciplines. So God begins to bring the truth to light and there are these different movements that are starting. But something happens as these movements are started. Does anyone know what that is? As these movements became started, once Martin Luther came on the scene, he shared what he had to share. It's almost like the people that followed him stopped moving forward. They stopped progressing and seeking to understand more truth so the whole system of truth could be followed. You began to have denominations that began to adopt creeds of faith that says this is what we believe and we're not trying to hear anything else, right? Right? So the Bible says in Proverbs 4.18 that the path of the just is as a shining light that shineth brighter and brighter unto a perfect day. The idea was God was starting here, but he wanted more and more truth to be uncovered until the total system of truth was back in play. But because some of these groups stopped moving with the progression of light, he could no longer use them in the same way, and he had to keep raising up more and more movement. Does that make sense? So as the movements, and so you know that there's, there was a proliferation of churches that got started, proliferation of churches. And then in the 1800s, you had a movement that started in America, in the Northeast largely, 
1830s, going into the 1840s. And what was that movement called? <laughs> she said, she, she said, that's us. The, the Great Advent Movement, right? The Millerite Movement. And there's more and more truth that is being uncovered. Remember, this is all that God cares about. He's not loyal to any denomination. He's loyal to truth. And he's loyal to making sure that that truth is shining the brightest so that people may know, can see their way to him. So because of where some of the churches stopped, it was, not, it was needful that more stuff, more movements come into being. And so you had William Miller. We won't go into that too much because we'll do that when we do the Bible study. But you had William Miller, formerly a, a farmer, who begins to study the Bible in a very in-depth way with no blue letter Bible, no e-sword, no, no electronic devices, <laughs> just his Bible and a, and, a, and a Cruden's Concordance. And he studies through the whole Bible, not moving any faster than his ability to an understand what the text is saying. And he strikes upon what text that sets him off. Daniel 8.14, it changes his life, right? He studies it and he's like, man, if, if I could just figure out when this 2300 evenings and mornings starts, then I will know when the cleansing of the sanctuary will come, which in the mind of those then would equate to the Lord cleansing the, the earth with fire at his second coming. So he begins to believe then that if I know when this starts, then I'll know when Jesus is coming. I won't go into much detail because we're going to do that at the Bible study, but we know that Jesus doesn't come in 1843 or 1844 when it was thought that he would. And a movement that had been around 50,000 people strong in the Northeast comes down to about 50 people, right? And those 50 people said, listen, we know that our calculations were right. We know that, and there was no one, when you read the accounts of what happened with William Miller, even not from Adventist sources, but when you just read the accounts of what happened, no one could argue against his mathematics. No one could say that the date that you arrived at wasn't correct. But what, what they failed to understand was the event that was tied to that date. So these 50 people started to study what could be meant by the cleansing of the sanctuary. You'll remember I said that in Daniel 8, the Bible had said that the man of sin was going to cast the truth to the ground, right? And one of the major aspects of truth that was cast to the ground was the sanctuary service. When God gave Israel that whole system of truth, at the heart of it was the sanctuary service, which was the gospel in illustration. And that had been cast to the ground. The understanding of that was cast to the ground. And that's why men could now pray to other men for forgiveness of sin rather than their high priest in heaven. But God was like, I, I, don't, I don't want that. So he was seeking to bring it back. And those 50 people that began to study further came to the discovery again of the sanctuary in its fullest capacity. And with the sanctuary came other truths such as the Sabbath and other things that began to be added to this movement that would become the Adventist church. And so I want to suggest to you that God's purpose in the Adventist church is to finish that reformation. Did you hear what I say, what your purpose is? It's to finish the reformation. There is a system of truth that God is seeking to reestablish not just so that we can say, I know it, pat myself on the back. But when you have that system of truth, when that light is shining brighter, people will be able to see their way to Jesus and what he needs for them to, to come together with him on so that they can go home with him when he comes again. That's what the whole thing is about. It's not for arguing for Bible study's sake or to prove what I know and what you don't have. Jesus is like, listen, when you lost Eden, you fell mentally, spiritually, physically, and socially. All, in all aspects, you, you fell. And the key is for me to restore you in all of these aspects. So I'm giving you a truth that's calculated to restore you. That's what the health message is for. It's not so you can live just to 150 years on this earth. Because who would want to just live forever on this earth? 
with all the craziness that we have to behold, but it's about preparing us so that we might be able to see him. And the question for you and me is, are we progressing with the light of truth that God has given us? Are we progressing with that truth? Are we walking in that truth? Are we walking in that truth? And then are we, are we making sure that others are able to behold that truth? Because that's why Jesus waits. Have you thought about that? Have you thought about why Jesus waits? All these years later, why he waits? There is something that he's seeking to accomplish because of his love for man that he is willing to wait, not forever, but he's willing to wait so that it might be accomplished so that whosoever will might be saved. But some of those who don't know yet, the reason why they don't know is because as a movement, we've, we've in some, I'll say we've lost sight of what we're, we've stopped moving. We're like a stagnant water that's just swirling around, not even fully understanding why we're here. And what is it that God is seeking to use us for? What makes us different? Again, not because we're better, but just like those 12 disciples who he used to turn the world upside down, he wanted to use this movement to turn the world upside down. How are you doing in your part in it? You can't speak for the whole church. You can't speak for the worldwide movement. But how are you doing in your part in that? At the end of the day, that's all that matters. What, what is my part in it? And so as I said to you the last time, we are starting a Bible study that's reigniting the Advent movement, right? That's helping us to understand how do we get here? How, how are our doctrines formed? How can we really see it biblically so that we won't be afraid to proclaim it because we may not know how to answer some of the questions that may arise from it? On your sheet, I have my phone number and the email address that you can use to contact me. A few of you have already told me that you are interested some folks from Carrollton Church said they were interested. Uche is preaching there on the 20th. And once we've had an opportunity to talk to them, then we're going to set a date for us to get started. So that's what the delay, delay has been for those who've expressed an interest. We just want to make sure we can do things in sync with the folks at Carrollton. So we may have one Bible study. Maybe it's a Zoom Bible study, and both in person and, and on the phone. If someone can come here and they want to, great. If not, then We'll have Zoom available for people to be present as well. But we think that this is very important. I want to read a last quote for you as we end. Um, this is from Testimonies to the Church, Volume 9, page 19, paragraph 1. In a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. To them has been entrusted the last warning for a perishing world. On them is shining wonderful light from the word of God. They have been given a work of the most solemn import, the proclamation of the first, second, and third angel's message. There is no other work of so great importance. They are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. Did you get that? Nothing else. Not even, I'm speaking to myself for now, not even making a living. Nothing else should absorb our attention. And it is not by accident that God is allowing the very quarterly we're going through to be about this work that is of such a solemn import. He's trying to really get our attention to it. Last scripture, go to Hebrews 11 for me. Hebrews 11, and we're going to look at verse 39 and 40. Hebrews 11, 39 and 40. So Hebrews 11, you all may know it's the faith chapter. It goes through many who've, you know, ran the race, if you will. And then at the end of this, it says this. And these all, meaning everyone that was mentioned before, and these all having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Here's the last thing I want you to leave, leave you with. You remember we talked about that four-man relay race where the first person wins, the third person, the second person, the third person, and on, on and on? That relay race can never come to an end until the anchor leg is ran, and that's the last leg of the race. No one gets any sort of trophy 
until the last man crosses the finish line. What am I saying in this? Hebrews said, these all having ran, so everyone that was mentioned, Abraham, Isaac, Moses, all of these having ran, obtained, having <coughs> obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. Everyone is literally still waiting. Well, Moses is in heaven, but the full promise he hasn't received yet because we're not there with him, right? But many of those who've ran before, our pioneers, everyone is waiting in the grave waiting on that last generation to finish their race. And they cannot receive their prize, if you will, the prize of that resurrection and looking in the face of Jesus until this last generation finishes their race. How long are we going to allow them to wait, right? How long are we going to allow them to wait? And more importantly, how long will we allow Jesus to wait? We can do our closing here.